Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Connected Recruiting Onboarding Workshop. We'll just give everybody a few minutes here to log in and get settled, and then we will kick off shortly. you've just joined, we're just giving everyone a, a few minutes to log in. We'll get kicked off here in a, in a minute or two. All right. I think we're ready to kick off. Welcome everybody to our Connected Recruiting Workshop today. Um, focusing specifically on the onboarding phase of connected recruiting. So if you have joined us for our um, previous workshops or even our webinar series before that, we welcome you back. If this is your first time attending, we welcome you uh, we welcome you to the show and welcome you to get involved and um, and engaged with the session today. Um, a few housekeeping things before we get started. Please use the Q and a to ask any questions. Again, this is a collaborative workshop. We would love interaction and engagement from everyone. So we will be using the Q&A to, to help answer questions and Billy will be taking a look at that as we move through the course of today's session. Um, additionally, if we look at what we're going to cover, um, these are the three main areas we're gonna focus on. So onboarding phase and kind of a recap and overview of what exactly that means from a connected recruiting standpoint, looking at onboarding best practices, right? We have a lot of experience and data when it comes to understanding what best practices have been and successful and, and what strategies have worked with our clients. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the most important piece, right, is how to achieve those best practices. We, we'll take those learns and really put those into action and talk about how we achieve that um, moving forward through connected recruiting. Uh, I am Laura Bumby. I am a senior manager of sales and strategy here at Bullhorn. Uh, I'm the ringmaster for today, but really the star of the show is Billy Davis. So Billy, would you care to introduce yourself? Sure. So hello, everyone. Um, hopefully you might know kind of some of my background, but if not, kind of put this together here, just a, a brief little kind of summary. I, I've been automating in the staffing and recruiting space since 2016. It's actually the first full-time Herefish employee and was a Herefish client even before then. So uh, Bullhorn Automation formerly known as, as Herefish. And then uh, in that capacity, I was uh, the former director of implementation, success and support, and then played a role in kind of broadening out each of those departments. I've done 300 plus implementations myself over the course of time, worked with over 800 companies. So that's where kind of this expertise comes from. And there is a rumor that I happen to be cyborg kind of half robot. So uh, take advantage of that uh, whenever you can for automation advice. I can vouch for the fact that he is absolutely, <laughs> that's not a rumor. <laughs> Thanks, Billy. Appreciate that. Um, so before we dive into to a lot of what Billy's going to cover today, I just wanted to kind of recap and, um, and level set again on connected recruiting and, and what that means. Um, it all kicks off with our three pillars of automation. So having that productivity, right, having bullhorn automation in the background, ensuring that, you know, we're doing the right actions at the right time thinking about the experience pillar and understanding that um, the experience that our candidates are having through omni-channel communication um, and other different forms of communication, whether that be email, but that's happening at, um, um, at important moments and we're not having any more black holes as we're thinking about experience. Um, and then finally, data health, right? We wanna ensure that all of this um, data and all of this information that we're automating is, is correct. Right, we want to make sure we have that correct data always, and so making sure we have data health interventions running in the background is going to ensure um, this from the very beginning. And this then leads us into connected recruiting. So it, hopefully, most of you are familiar with this, what we call our connected recruiting flywheel. But again, just to recap, connected recruiting is a methodology. Right, it's a methodology that's going to empower you to engage your talent at every stage of that candidate life cycle. So thinking about your technology and your teams and taking your best practices and putting those all together 
to inform a connected recruiting strategy. This allows us to do things like ensure um, that we're having an incredible candidate experience. It allows us to think about the cost of candidate acquisition and, and lowering that. Um, it allows us to also increase redeployment rates. Um, and then also thinking about how we're engaging our talent pools throughout the, the entire flywheel. So um, this is kind of the basis today. Obviously, we're focusing on, on that onboarding phase. And there's a reason for that, right? So if we look at some of the data, we have some great data from a connected recruiting standpoint um, about what we've seen in the industry and about what we've heard um, during our surveys from, from clients. And I'll call out a couple of these stats right here that are really important. But if we think about onboarding and what that experience looks like, over you know, almost three quarters of candidates have abandoned a job opportunity before it took too, because it took too long. So um, we're also gonna throw a poll on the screen if you think about it. So we'd love to have your participation in that. Um, so you know, please have a chance to answer if you see that up there. Um, the other stat I'd love to call out is 76, again, almost three quarters of, over three quarters um, of, of I-9s that are collected have at least one error, right? So one findable error that we could potentially have a, an audit risk for. Um, and then finally, that 30% of workers report a time-consuming onboarding as a top challenge. Think about the times that you potentially have started in a new business or feedback that you've gotten from candidates, right? What does that look like and how does that um, turn into then an experience for your candidates? So we'll talk about some of this again today and how that relates to our best practices. But connected recruiting, again, then falls over your entire camp, excuse me, your talent relationship life cycle. So thinking about, hey, this might be, um, you might no recognize some of these stages here as workflows that are part of your um, talent relationship life cycle and how you're engaging with candidates. But thinking about, hey, bringing that new applicant in, are they able to easily apply? Are we then able to communicate with them in an omni-channel way through text, email, chat box? Um, then moving into the hiring process, right? Collecting documents, managing credentials, interview planning. Um, and then once we have them on board, how are they able to enter their time? How are we able to access their pay information? And then as we get towards the end of, uh, end of an assignment, re-engaging that candidate, right? How has your assignment been? Are, are you open to going back out on assignment? We'd love that feedback. We'd love a referral, getting those NPS surveys. So this is really kind of, if we overlay that flywheel into your talent relationship life cycle, this is where, why, what it looks like, and this is why it's really important. Um, so if we think about onboarding, the onboarding stage of the connected recruiting flywheel, specifically, what does it mean for you, right? Well, it allows you to deliver that positive, seamless experience as we think about the lead up to the first day of that candidate's assignment, and then throughout the assignment. Um, so, you know, from an onboard perspective, we're going to decrease no-show rates, right? We're going to increase that talent satisfaction. We're also going to be thinking about important considerations, right? How are we managing and staying compliant with forms and, and I-9s and other documents? How are we preparing that talent for their first day? Are we thinking about self-service? Um, and do you have, like, plans for check-in or engagement? Or how are we keeping those candidates warm and, and understanding that, your business is there to support them throughout the assignment and, and as they move towards end of assignment. So those are some things to consider as we um, kind of level set on, on connected recruiting and specifically the onboarding phase. Billy, I will uh, hand it to you from here to get into the Excellent. details. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thanks for that great introduction. So first up here, just kind of give you an idea of what kind of doing the onboarding phase correctly can produce as far as results go. So this is an example of a kind of a candidate in you know, net promoter score that we've seen from a high performing connected recruiting client. Also just threw a, a poll up to figure out, you know, how many of you are measuring the satisfaction of your place candidates. So obviously you, you're not going to be able to gather this data without first asking for it. And then obviously, you know, making the experience an incredible one can yield and produce results similar to this where you have a preponderance of promoters, you know, and, and very few kind of in the middle or detractors. Now, of course, you could also measure your client satisfaction. So, you know, many, many companies will, will measure the candidate satisfaction, but not as many measure the client typically. So doing so you can achieve and kind of also measure and get, and get some great results. 
So again, another poll popped up here. Curious to know how many of you are measuring your client satisfaction with your place candidates. And hopefully when you do and you optimize kind of all of your processes, you can achieve results similar to this. And then, so beyond just kind of satisfaction, you know, improvements that you can, you can create, you can also create some results similar to this. So for example, one of our clients, uh, kind of in a before and after putting this connected recruiting methodology into place, they achieved uh, a, a reduction by 40% of their no call, no show rates. So just imagine not only the, the boost to your revenue, but your candidate and client satisfaction, right? If you have a 40% decrease in, in candidates that aren't showing up to work on that first day. And also just think of the efficiency unlocks your team gains by not having to put out as many fires, getting those phone calls of, hey, we need a replacement as soon as possible, uh, things, things of that nature. And then you can also, you know, another great kind of use case and case study we received was a client that used automation, you know, kind of throughout this process to ensure that every place candidate got the essential information about the job, the client, working for, for them as a staffing firm goes. So it's really a way to standardize your approach, ensure that all essential information is covered. And then you know, also make sure that you're in full compliance with everything that you need to be, uh, which can have a, a wide variety of benefits for your, for your whole business. So those are some of the results that you can kind of do with, with putting this methodology in place. So moving to kind of what are some best practices, what are some tips and tricks to get the most out of your onboarding phase so that you can kind of get your results uh, similar to some of those high mark standards that we've seen from clients. So the first best practice gonna just gonna talk about here is around kind of checking in from the, the job offer to the start date period of time. Now, this is a period of time and depending upon the type of staffing or recruitment that you do, this could be a longer period of time, this could be short, this could be literally like same day, depending on uh, different, different staffing that you do. But it's an essential period of time because Everybody's really happy when the job offer happens, but you want to make sure that you guide that candidate to the start date, to the placement, and ensure that they're there. So a, a few things that you can kind of do to make that happen. So number one is you, you want to open up and ensure that you're having communication throughout this vital period. Um, you know, you want to make sure that there's no crickets, there's no kind of gaps of communication so that you can ensure that you're... Uh, going to be kind of proactively aware of any hiccups or anything that's going on in the process. So also a really good idea to track and measure what what the average time or what the time is going from that job offer to the start date, also the, the rates in which that drop off might occur and identify opportunities to improve that. But I'll see in an ideal world, you want that as short as possible because uh, you know, that's where you'll have the best results. You want to follow up on any outstanding requirements. And again, this can vary depending on the type of staffing that you do and also kind of the client by client requirements. But there's you know, many cases where a job offer will go out and then there's additional kind of um, requirements, documentation, you know, verification things that need to be done. So automation is a great way to ensure that those things are progressing as they should. And if they're not kind of sending an alert, sending a reminder, uh, to, to remind either the candidate and or the recruiter who, or whoever's handling your hiring process uh, to follow up and ensure that that's getting done. Making sure that the candidate is fully prepared. It's also an, another way automation can be leveraged to, to make this happen. So it's providing that kind of essential information, uh, standardizing it so that your clients have the confidence in knowing that every candidate that's going through the process is, is getting that, that information. But you know, if the candidate is fully prepared, then you're going to reduce a lot of the anxiety or the worry um, of, of kind of that, that this period of time from that job off offer to the start date, and you're going to kind of equip them for the best chance for success. And then lastly here, you want to use this period of time to have this open communication so that you can find out about problems and issues proactively. So if, if you discover someone can't start on their start date, but you only discover that after they're supposed to start, right? That's a very different scenario than if you discovered that a day or two ahead of when they're supposed to start. 
So if you can kind of proactively find out information, open up a line of communication so that your, your place candidates feel comfortable sharing that information, um, you can have a variety of, of much better outcomes um, if any issues do arise. So the next tip here is, is around standardizing client information that the candidates receive. So really important, and I've actually seen this you be used as a differentiator. And uh, some of our clients you use it as a way to uh, kind of um, propose and, and hit home a partnership and a consultative approach where you know, they offer this as a, as a differentiator in that every candidate that's getting represented by your staffing firm, if you put this in place correctly, you can ensure that the exact right information is getting shared to them every single time. So the, the candidate or the hiring manager doesn't have to worry about um, kind of covering some of these, these things on their end. And they know that when the place candidate gets to them, they're going to be better prepared. They're going to have the necessary information. So what does this look like? So number one is upfront. You, you need to partner with the client to ensure that you have all the right information that they want to be shared. Um, so it's a great way to just hit home the partnership aspect because you need them to be able to determine what is the, the essential information, what are good things to share. You know, in, in my recruiting experience, we had really high success rates where we also kind of partnered with clients to show video walkthroughs of their facility, uh, kind of a, a day in the life type uh, example videos. And it was really beneficial for candidates as well because they had an idea of what to expect going in. Uh, they, they weren't uh, kind of totally unaware of, of what, what was going to be going on. And then you can also take this to the next level with automation. You can put things in place uh, to ensure that the candidate recipient watched or reviewed the information that's being shared. And then that can be sent and communicated with the client. So it's a way that you can kind of confirm and verify that not only are you presenting the information, but it's getting received, it's getting watched. Um, and again, it can be a great way to kind of hone in on a, on a client partnership. The number three best practice here is to catch mistakes before they become mistakes, which of course is the dream of every payroll um, or specialist in the business. Like if, if you have to wait until payroll has processed to fix a mistake, it becomes a lot more painful requires a lot more work, but if you can proactively identify and fix those things before you process pay, uh, it, it makes everyone's life a lot better. So some things that you can do to kind of to do this. So we have several clients that create automated warnings. If bill pay rates, margin rates, anything along those lines exceed certain thresholds. So think about you know, somebody puts the decimal in the wrong space. Somebody puts an extra zero that's not supposed to be there. Um, somebody you know, just copies a, a bill rate into a pay rate. So you, they're exactly the same. So th things of, of that nature, you can put kind of triggers and warnings around to ensure that if they do pop up, somebody gets notified, can review, looks at it, fixes it before you actually process pay but before it happens. You can also use automation to, to have incorporate into your process to review and approve to ensure that accurate information is getting stamped uh, kind of before you process and before it goes into your bill or pay cycles. And then there's a lot of other things that you can do to kind of correct just inaccurate uh, information or things that are missing. So like one of my favorite examples around incorrect dates is you can find any placements that get created that have start dates or end dates uh, in the past. So um, that can be a, a common occurrence if you're going really quickly or if you're copying an old job order and then creating a new placement just, just out of the blue. So that's something that you can put in place to alert somebody that you might not, if they're going quickly, if they're putting a placement in the system, they might not catch themselves, but it could be a way automation can help create that safety net. Same around the missing information. You know, obviously you can do that from a validation perspective on some required fields. But you can also ensure automation, you know, is making sure that uh, certain all fields have information. If there's no information in a certain field, that can be a trigger for an, an alert. And then um, you also want to, you know, in your onboarding process, you want to look for opportunities where you can have 
the kind of validations built into your documentation and throughout the process to prevent mistakes from even happening. So like the, the stat that Laura mentioned earlier, where, you know, paper I-9s are, are prone, three quarters or above are prone to at least one mistake. You know, a lot of that can be fixed if it's digitized, if you have validations in place uh, to ensure that kind of correct values are in the correct fields. Number four is around capturing client and candidate feedback. So this goes back to, obviously, you're not going to be able to know what the satisfaction rates are of candidates and clients unless you're asking. So the first step is, is to certainly do that. And then this is what it looks like as far as how you can achieve this. So you want to ask, you want to ask, number one, for the feedback during the onboarding process. And depending upon how long the process is, you might want to ask multiple times and at, at different kind of key stages. And then kind of getting the information is step one. But then what you use and how you use the information is really where you can differentiate and provide a lot of value. So you can use this feedback, use this information to fix pain points throughout the process, identify you know areas of, of friction or, or areas where people get confused, but you can also find out ways that you can proactively create answers to either common questions or kind of common misconceptions throughout the process. So then you can continually improve and make this experience an incredible one for your candidates and your clients. And speaking of making an incredible candidate and client experience, part of that certainly is enabling self-service. So if the more that a candidate or a client has the opportunity to self-serve and kind of knock out some of these things on their own terms, their own time, uh, the more efficient your whole process will be and more likely you know, the satisfaction through with the process is also going to improve. So if you can reduce the time it takes to complete these things, you're going to have a lot happier candidates and clients. So here are some things to think about when you're kind of thinking about self-service and how you can enable it. Um, you, I mean, self-service is a, is a necessary requirement to create an automated and efficient onboarding. You know, you, you want to make sure that, that you're doing it at every step of the process that you can. You want to deliver that right information proactively, whether that's the job offer stage, you know, before somebody starts, uh, what documentation needs to be done, information about, you know, how to view, how to enter time, how to, how to view pay stubs. You know, think about all the different areas as far as the onboarding journey goes. And then what are, how can you prevent, how can you prevent questions before they even come up? How can you present information uh, to candidates proactively to, to ensure that, that they have everything they need? Um, being able to complete and view documents on in that self-serve component is essential because you know, to, to make sure that they know what they've already done, what they need to do still, be a great way to get kind of a, a checklist of, of, of what's what's going on. If you don't have self-service enabled, they have to rely upon somebody else telling them what else is remaining. And it also can just be a, a great way to reduce how daunting some of this process can be. If you can clearly know, okay, I have five things to do. I've done three. I have two remaining. You get a full visibility of all those things that are happening um, yourself. It's a lot easier than, than kind of not knowing and just relying on somebody else to tell you, okay, now we got to do this next thing and then this next thing. Um, allowing a, a candidate, place candidate to initiate communication with a recruiter or somebody in your back office if, if the need arises, right? And this is especially important as you kind of satisfy a, a large or, or different generational uh, aspects of, of your placed candidates. You know, some, some people might, be more comfortable talking with a recruiter, talking with um, you know a, a payroll specialist, somebody in HR to help them figure out a question, figure out an area, and then some others might want to just self serve completely. So having mul multiple options there is is key. Um, being able to self serve when you're entering time, viewing pay stubs, viewing your your pay details, updating those pay details, right? like that is is all really great as far as an experience goes. I mean, the, the example that we like to commonly use is, is think about, you know, how you interact with your bank today, you know, like very, very large proportions of people want to use an app and you know, we use some sort of a mobile friendly um, interaction there so they can self-serve, view those things, update key details, right, if, if they want to do that. And it goes hand in hand with the next point, you need to make sure that this is mobile optimized. 
right? So they have the self-serve that can can live where a candidate lives. And many of them, that that's with a, a mobile device. And then you want to have a single place to go. And this kind of speaks to the, the greater mission and, and the greater idea around the utopia of having a single source of truth. Um, it's It becomes a lot more disjointed and, and a lot kind of rougher experience on the, the candidate side of things if you're getting bounced from one platform to another, to another, to another, you know, having a single place to go to manage this whole process makes it much easier to navigate. Also makes it much easier to remind somebody, but it makes their experience much easier as they're filling out and, and entering information. So the next item is around uh, automating documentation. So um, one of the, one of the, the, points earlier on the data points is is around kind of compliance or kind of risks and some of the, the costs associated with um you know if if compliance goes wrong you know automating documentation is a, is a great start um to, to mitigate a lot of those problems so you know using automation to to correctly and dynamically provide the right and correct documentation depending upon the needs of the particular placement is really vital so then you can ensure that you're in, you know, federal compliance, you're in state compliance, depending on what type of employment is happening. Um, you, know, you can use automation to be your rules and logic engine to make sure that, you know, that the correct documents, the correct forms are, are going out to, to the right candidates. Uh, putting in automated reminders and alerts to ensure that the documentation is progressing kind of on an, on an ideal path. And anytime that there's outliers or things are stalled, you know, being able to you know, gently nudge the candidate to kind of move things along, gently nudge a recruiter to follow up if that's not effective, right, can help shrink the time, total time, and also increase your total completion rates. Next one is really big, you want to reduce errors, right? So shifting from manual entry of things to, to automated greatly reduces errors. I saw a stat that out of 10,000 entries, if things are getting manually done on a single stroke, as far as single stroke data entry, you could expect something like 400 errors if you're doing that manually. But if you do that automated in the right way, you can expect less than one error for every 10,000 entries. So it's a way to drastically reduce the errors that are happening, or in some cases, eliminating them um, from, from the get-go. And then this, obviously this shrinks the, the time to complete, which is a really important metric. And then it also ensures a higher chance of you being in compliance, which is also really important. And then, you know, a, a great way to kind of look at the opportunities and ask yourself this is to kind of audit your process and identify where in the process do you have kind of really labor intensive manual tasks that happen. And I remember back in my staffing days, uh, there was a time before we were automating or, or digitizing this onboarding, um, you know, we would have to have one of our payroll specialists sit down and go over a stack of paperwork and forms that took anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes with a place candidate, right? So, so that's an example of something that's very labor, labor intense and manual, you know, very one-to-one, -one. but if you digitize correctly, do things right, you can have optimize, right? And, and kind of devote those time and resources elsewhere. Number seven, is around creating reminders around submitting time and you know things around like viewing pay stubs and pay details. So how to put this one in place. So again, this you'll notice proactive is is scattered throughout all of these. It's it's a really important uh, kind of fundamental uh, concept, but you, you want to be able to do some proactive reminders for candidates to fill out their time. So think of, you know, like, Every Friday, whatever your pay period ends, you know, a day or two before that pay period ends, you could just send a quick, quick text, quick email, quick text and email if you want to, just letting everyone know that's you know in a placement that needs to send time, send time. You know, just a reminder to enter your time. You can even put a link to how they would go and click the link to go enter their time, right? So that proactive reminder of every week, just getting that. Hey, just quick reminder, need to do it. But then you can also build in reactive reminders. So following up with people that have missed a deadline or haven't entered time, I mean, there can be a variety of reasons why somebody doesn't enter time. Maybe they didn't work last week, you didn't know, but you can create automations to remind, alert, follow up, 
um, and kind of gather that before you know too much time has passed um, and, and also do that more efficiently. And again, in those messages, you can remind candidates, you know, point them to hopefully your single source where every, everything can be viewed, you know, how they can view pay stubs, change pay details, those types of things. Um, you know, if you do those proactive and reactive messages correctly, you greatly cut down on the amount of kind of billing or payroll follow up that's needed. And you also cut down on kind of any of the mistakes that need to get rectified any of those things with clients. And then of course, clients are happier because uh, you don't have to do this um, kind of back and forth pay um, or, or, or billing adjustments, right? It saves, saves time. It makes the experience better for everyone involved. The next best practice is around proactively answering questions. So again, if, if you, it, like one of the keys to providing a great experience is if you can preemptively give somebody the information before they kind of ask a question. It, it's a it's a great way to let them know that you're thinking of them, you've kind of put yourself in their shoes and that you're trying to, to provide the best experience you can. So some ways that you can make this possible. So we talked about earlier using that feedback that you're gathering from candidates and clients, NPS surveys, to you know figure out where the pain points, what is, where's friction happening, and then using those things to create uh, commonly asked questions, you know, FAQs, things of that nature, and then making that available and, and disseminating that through automation. Um, I think one of the best tips, and this is for basically anything in, in your tech stack or your process, is put yourself through the process so you can understand it from the point of view of the candidate or the client that's going through it. Right? That'll allow you to identify things that um, were painful for you or that took too long, uh, and you can kind of use use that to proactively provide a better experience. And like I said, again, all if you kind of proactively provide access to answers so someone can self-serve and answer something that for themselves if they have a question, uh, it's always going to provide a great experience. And it's also going to keep you one step ahead to make sure that you're continuously improving and make sure that you're kind of eliminating pain points uh, wherever you identify and wherever you can. The next, next best practice is around mixing automated and, and personalized communication, right? There's many elements in the onboarding process where automated communication is a really good idea. You know, those reminders, those proactive reminders to fill in time, for example. But there's other opportunities where, you know, having a personalized touch or an opportunity for a personalized touch, if someone wants to take advantage of it, can provide a great experience, a great differentiator. So mixing and blending these two will always lead to a really optimal result. So what does that look like? So this is where you can use internal reminders to, to mix in some commu human communication when and where it's needed. Um, you know, one of the things that we found really successful was, you know, in our in our lead up to the first day of work, we'd have a lot of automated reminders and emails to a candidate. But then, you know, after the first day of work or after the first week of work, we'd have a reminder, go to our recruiter to reach out for a call and, and see, you know, how was the experience on the job first week? How did it go? And it was a great way to provide, you know, that kind of personalized touch and, and provide a great experience. And also gave a lot of great insights as far as what was going on, identify problems before they, they came about, et cetera. Um, this also you know, allows that providing those additional options to ensure your entire workforce is accounted for, right? So you, you're hiring a, a, a wide variety of, of different generations that are going to have different communication preferences. Some will want this automated or self-serve or, or something where they can get that, but then others will, will yearn for a personalized call or opportunity to you know, contact information. If they have a problem, they can talk to a person. So that allows, you can unlock that if, if you do this in the correct way. And then you know, that, that personal touch will always be an essential requirement to provide that incredible experience. Um, and so, and, you know, ensuring that you can do so efficiently is, is the importance of having those automated reminders and check-ins that are happening. And then lastly, number 10 here is, is just a, really a best practice for, again, any of your process or flows, but mapping your workflow end-to-end, -end, especially in the onboarding space, is essential so you can understand all the nuance everything that's happening all the interactions that are occurring from start to finish so you can provide a holistic solution a, a really great experience but then figure out 
you know, where you need to improve throughout that process. So this allows you to understand the whole process from the start to the finish. So, and, and make that whole process better. You discover the pain points, you know, the, the friction points in the process that you want to reduce or hopefully eliminate. And it also unlocks improvement opportunities for you uh, to, to ensure that you're, you're making every step of the journey as, as beneficial as you can. Um, and then it also, you know, another key point here is, you know, by digitizing your, your onboarding solution, by incorporating automatic elements into it, you can discover ways, if you have that end-to-end -end awareness, you can discover ways to, to integrate throughout your other processes and potentially reduce data entry points by like auto-populating things that you already know, you already confirmed or correct. And obviously that will uh, prevent someone else from having to enter it in manually, but also increases your, your chance of quality information, reduces errors because you're, you're kind of auto-populating known and correct data um, kind of from one part of your ATS CRM um, into this onboarding flow. And obviously another benefit of having that single source of truth that you're unlocking. So just to kind of recap of these 10 items, and then we'll get into a Q&A section here. But you want to have check-ins from your job offer to your start date to ensure that you're uh, communicating through that process, kind of guiding your candidate uh, during that vital time, ensuring that they land and, and, and start on their start date. You want to standardize the client information that the candidates receive so they know what to expect. And then your, candidate, your clients will uh, definitely appreciate knowing that everyone coming to their facility um, has this as a certain uh, level of information and, and understanding about what, what, is, what is it that they do. Catching mistakes before they become mistakes. You'll be a, a payroll hero by preventing you know, any mistakes that go out before you know, pay processes. So you know, proactively fixing those things, always a fantastic idea. You want to capture client and candidate feedback, you know, both sides of the coin, the key stages throughout your onboarding lifecycle, and use that feedback to improve. Enable self-service, right? mobile, mobile optimized, but provide the ability for candidates and clients to self-serve whenever possible and reduce friction throughout your onboarding experience. You want to automate documentation so that you ensure the right candidate for the right placement is getting the right documentation, reduce the errors involved there, but then also automate the check-ins, the reminders to ensure that it's processing and things are getting done. Um, sending reminders proactively and reactively to candidates about entering time, where they can view pay details, where they can self-serve. Um, proactively answering questions up front. That's a key to providing that incredible experience. Mixing automated and personal communications. You know, so you can have both an efficient experience, but then also an incredibly uh, powerful one as well. And then lastly, mapping the workflow end to end uh, to ensure that you have total coverage of your whole process, you know all the integration points, um, and then you can optimize and improve every step of the way. So with that, we'll jump into uh, the Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask in the Q&A. Um, I'll start with some of the, the first ones here. So... Um, First question is, what, what is the most important consideration around onboarding, kind of where to start? Um, so I'd say I think where to start is a good spot is kind of thinking about kind of the fully integrated and, and automated onboarding solution, because it's going to provide you the best opportunity to be efficient while also reducing your errors, uh, reducing your compliance risk. And then, you know, like, like I mentioned a couple of times in a couple of the points, having that kind of single source of truth um, where you can, you know, in, ensure that you're having one spot to go to, um, you know, all aspects of the business are pointing to the single source of truth. Um, you know, greatly reduces or eliminates the costly mistakes, but it's also going to make you hyper efficient. Uh, the second question here, oh, this is a good one. Uh, it's around what are uh, some KPIs to focus on during the, the onboarding phase? So that is a good question. Um, definitely that the time it takes from job offer to hire. So thinking about that, tracking it, 
thinking about any fall off rates that happened during that time. That's a, a really good data point to keep an eye on and, and, and improve. Um, things around documents. So document uh, completion rates and that the, the average time it takes somebody to complete those. Both um, completion time as in when someone starts and when someone finishes. So you can figure out like, is it is it really taking someone uh, a really long time in a certain part of the stage? How can you make that more efficient? But then also kind of total time from when you send it to when they complete it to figure out what your turnaround time is holistically. Um, MPS obviously is for candidates and clients. So it's, it's a great KPI to focus, hone in on, improve. Um, compliance issues. So any issues that come up that are costly, um, you, you definitely want to kind of track that and hopefully reduce those. And then lastly, a, a great kind of holistic um, number is just trying to figure out your cost per onboarding and um, hopefully do things to drive that lower or, or to make that more efficient. So that's a good question. Cool. So another question here is around when when standardizing information that that candidates receive, um, what, what's the best way to limit information overload? Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great question. I think something that I found to be really helpful is by kind of measuring how much information has been retained or kind of, you know, not only the clients appreciate that because you're kind of verifying that the information is is getting known, but it also give you a good barometer as far as how much is too much. And this also goes back to measuring, you know, with sat with surveys and getting feedback. You know, that'll be a good barometer as well to figure out how how much is too much. But I think generally speaking, also too, like you don't want to do everything all at once. You know, if if you bombard a candidate with you know, here's basically like a novel of all the things you need to know about this company. Here's 15 videos you need to watch. You know, you're not likely going to be successful in, in them retaining that information or even completing it, right? But if, if you drip it out over time or if you parse it down to the essential elements, you're going to have a much, much better uh, chance of, of that happening. Uh, next question here is... Um, if we see generally Bullhorn Automation users drafting content from within Bullhorn Automation kind of first, um, or are they, they populating content from custom fields on the jobs from within the ATS? That's a very good question. I think the more that you can do dynamically with kind of custom fields and things, uh, the more efficient your own admins are gonna be when they're building out items. Um, another thing to think about is, and it, this depends upon your business, but in most companies, you'll have kind of key clients. You have clients that you do a ton of business with. So it, it might make sense to create kind of customized templates for that one client where then you can have that information, but there's a wide variety of things you can do to make that efficient and just having that information stored on the job record. Like one of the things that we did was we had a custom field that would would have um, the YouTube links for the video facility walkthroughs, for example. So that's something that we could just merge in, and we we you could have that come in dynamically, no matter what job uh, you know somebody was getting hired for. So that's um, that's one one way you can kind of think about that. Next question here is around um, what fields does Bullhorn Automation have access to? Yeah, and then I mean, the kind of the context of the question is, are they able to see if a professional has entered their time? Um, and this depends upon kind of the setup and, and some of the other things that you have going on in your tech stack ecosystem. And, but kind of this goes back to the, I think the really key point about having that single source of truth, having you know, your everything integrate back to the ATS, because when it's set up the correct way, you can absolutely have, you know, that information right back into a place that Bullhorn Automation can then automate or trigger off of. So I've seen, you know, for example, um, you can have an area on the placement record that'll indicate if somebody has entered their time and then every week it'll toggle back to no. So then, you know, you, you know that if they have entered their time for that week um, and then obviously that can be used from a automation trigger perspective to have those alerts, put out those reminders 
um, things of that nature. Another question here around are there any plans for bullhorn automation metrics to be exportable in a more data-friendly way or available via API? Looks like when they're trying to view automation trends or kind of the impact of it from kind of time periods, quarter to quarter, year by year, um, looking for more kind of granularity to get into that data at that scale. A really good question here. Uh, there's a kind of two ways I'll answer this. I mean, number one, I'm sure many of you are aware uh, of of the the Bullhorn Analytics platform. So we are a relatively recent acquisition under the, the Bullhorn umbrella, but we're doing a lot of work with them currently to figure out ways to kind of collaborate and, and expose some of these automation metrics and, and abilities and kind of tying it in to what they do, which which makes you know data widely available, great dashboards, great reports for actionable insight. So we're doing a bunch of collaborative elements there to see how we can we can make uh, so, some of these things easier for, for kind of the whole ecosystem, and that certainly would satisfy this in a way. And then there's there's also some work that's getting done to allow some more options as well as far as the ability to um, kind of grab some of those specific bullhorn automation metrics and being able to to do um, kind of things that you want with it. Um, so one, one of the things that's been released relatively recently was the ability to webhook out of bullhorn automation, for example. So you could webhook out of bullhorn automation, some some key data, some key triggers, pass that into a third party system or, or somewhere else where you're housing this. Um, but there's there's a few different ways, but I, that the bullhorn analytics route, I'm, I'm really excited about because, again, that. If you, if you hear me say single source of truth too often, um, I don't think it's possible, but that, that's the that's the exciting part for me because it's all it's all under the ATS CRM umbrella. And then you'll be able to combine a lot of other interesting things that are happening, you know, um, and, and be able to get those insights. Awesome. Let me see. And got another question here around... Um, is there a plan for for Bullhorn automation to give users the uh, ability to sync all Bullhorn one fields to help with kind of the number three thing with kind of catching mistakes? And yes, that kind of expanded functionality into you know additional fields, additional entities is uh, on the roadmap for sure. In conjunction with so kind of the mission of Bullhorn one is is everything um, that single source of truth, but then a key component is then automating. And having the ability to touch all the middle and back office points uh, in time, and another another thing that will likely kind of occur, and, and it's, it's getting kind of worked on as well, is the ability to even expand what we can do today, um, as far as the ability to to do some some deeper analysis of of fields. So um, so there's a wide variety of things that you can do today to create those alerts for things that are kind of beyond certain thresholds, but then. The ability to compare field to fields, or uh, you know value amounts, things like that, to create some um, additional uh, thresholds, is also something that's kind of on on the way in the future. Well, awesome! I think that gets through all the questions that I see. I don't know, Laura, other, if you see any yeah, I was going to say, if there's any other questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. If not, I think that might be everything. So thank, thank you, everyone, for attending today and for your collaboration in the chat. Um, as you can see here, we'd love for you to check out the Connected Recruiting um, section of the Bullhorn website if you have any more questions or if you want to kind of deep dive into some of these best practices. And Billy, I think you can take the other two there. Yeah. And then if you're interested in kind of upping your automation knowledge, have a couple of places here that you can you can do so. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm sharing staffing automation expertise or guidance every day, 11 a.m. Eastern. And then I also have a, a weekly automation newsletter where I get into some more in-depth guides, tutorials, et cetera, uh, around some, some really exciting things you can do with automation. So appreciate all of your time. Thanks for attending. And if you come up with any additional questions, let us know and we'll be happy to help. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.